to the Kung Fu Book Review. Today, we are going to be doing the Xing Yi Quan, Xing Yi Quan, Xing Yi Quan, should know how to say this martial art, Xing Yi Quan of the Chinese Army, um, which also includes a translation of Huang Bo Nian's Xing Yi Fist and Weapons Instruction. Um, so you get, you get two books in one with this one. Uh, and the author is Dennis Revere. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, overall, I give this a definite big thumbs up, right? If you're doing Xing Yi, you should, I think you should definitely buy this book, like definitely, right? Um, and the reason why is because whilst I'm not blown away by the actual applications and technical instruction in this book, uh, I think it's pretty basic stuff. Um, I think that it contains the essence of Xing Yi, right, in, in written form, both from uh, a, a sort of an older, you know, Asian author who was writing to teach Chinese people. So that's a sort of very pure essence of the art, right? Um, and as a military treatise, it actually to teach officers who were going to learn and use it in real violence and as a simple instruction manual. So like, this is what you need to learn, lads, let's get this done. And, you know, this is how to kill people, right? So, or how to, you know, fight and defend yourself with uh, empty hand, sword and bayonet, right? Okay, and I think that is that is something really important um, to, to bring over to your Xingyi practice. Um, and then also, I think, so, Dennis Revere uh, also brings that essence across in his instruction, right? Uh, because he is trained directly with um, the military uh, in... Taiwan, right? So, um, and I think that that's really, really important if you're doing Xingyi, as my, my view on it, because um, I think it's the distinctive feature of it compared to the other internal arts is that it is not really for um, personal growth, development, meditation, Taoism, all that stuff. Like those things are hard baked into Tai Chi and Bagua, especially, right? They are, you know, the core components of it, right? Bagua kind of began as a meditative art um, and then had some martial arts put into it. And now it's sort of kind of almost going full circle, pun fully intended, um, and is like now, you know, mostly practiced for meditation, right? Um, tai Chi, it's a bit more mixed, right? So it had some martial arts, a sort of Shaolin based martial art with some meditative parts, but then kind of got mixed with Wudang boxing and but now it's also, again, heavily focused on the Taoist principles, right? They're kind of core to its development. Whilst I think that Xing Yi is first and foremost is a military art, and then it sort of has happened to have been aligned with some of these principles. Um, but the, you know, it's in service to getting better at fighting, uh, not in some higher spiritual goal. So, which is, I think it's really important to read people that have actually, you know, books from people that have used it in earnest or train people that have. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about Dennis. So he's an American, uh, martial arts instructor. So he was, uh, involved in the military and has been involved with the U S military helping out the Taiwanese. Um, and yeah, has been directly related to training and instruction, empty hand and close combat techniques with knives, swords, uh, you know, bayonets on guns right so and this is one of the things that i find particularly interesting about this book is that the techniques from the spear um you know in xing Yi have been adapted in, you know all the way up to the modern sense of you know bayonet mounted to modern rifle right uh, and but also he fully explains the history of it where it was mounted to a uh, you know more early 20th century uh, rifle as well um so yeah um yeah, so he's got a good track record in history. I've never met him or trained with him or anything like that. So I don't know about the quality of his, you know, his movement and stuff in person. But uh, from what I've seen from the theory stuff, it's, I mean, it seems to be right on the money, right? And has a good track record of working with people that actually, you know, uh, as I said, use it in earnest, right? Which is, a, which is all big plus points for me. Good. So um, let's, what about the book? So it's a, uh, Sort of mid-length one, uh, we're up to about 144 pages. Um, and as I said, it's an interesting book because it's actually basically split in two. So you get a, so because he's worked alongside with another uh, Chinese guy, Chao Hon Huen, um, who did the translation. So the one of the real strengths of this book, I have to say, is the 
uh, is the translation, right? So it is, you know, uh, all translated into modern English uh, explanations of the way of speaking from 19th century and early 20th century Chinese have even been adapted and explained. And the method of how the translation is done and what choices were made is also explained at the beginning, which I think, uh, you know, the more that you read books that involve Chinese, the more that you understand that there is no, um, and also if you speak any Chinese, right, I'm a, I'm a sort of beginner basics, you know, sort of phrase book plus level speaker, right? Um, and uh, the more that you interact with Chinese, you learn that there's, there's, there's huge areas where there is no good translation or transliteration, right? There, there are really unique concepts. So the, the translator is obligated to uh, sort of invent new ways of, of saying that and often change the entire you know, structure to try and get it across to a Western audience, right? Uh, and if, if you don't, that sounds something very mystical, um, but it, it's not. It's just a feature of the structure of language, right? And so, and Chinese has particular characters and phrases that mean things that we often don't even have a word for in English. So we have to have a whole rambly sentence to explain explain that principle, right? Uh, and also, really, and there's a lot of stuff that has huge cultural baggage. So the four character phrases, um, you know. So to pick an example, uh, one of my favourite ones, some sort of early beginner ones, is uh, ma ma hu hu. So, which literally means horse, horse, tiger, tiger, right? So, uh, I mean, to a Western person, that's just, that's two animals, right? That doesn't mean anything, right? Um, but to a Chinese person, it means something that's a bit rubbish, like, and why is that? Is because there was a famous emperor, um, you know, many, many dynasties ago, who wanted a picture of a tiger and came in and looked at it and was like, is it a horse or is it a tiger? I don't really know, which kind of basically means the painting was a bit rubbish, right? So, and that and that became a kind of famous phrase because he said that and, you know, so, and, but the thing is that is not, you know, so that, that means, you know, things are a bit, a bit average. I can't tell if it's a horse or a tiger, right? Um, but, you know, with those, that you think, oh, that's just a particular example. No, 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 that is all over Chinese, right? Because with the way that Chinese is structured is that you, small, small, you know, a few small number of characters, right, can say a lot. So these three, four, five character phrases are all over the language, right? Uh, and it's designed in this way, right, where context dependent meaning is, is sort of integral to Chinese speaking. Um, so having a good, what does that all mean? Having a good translator who is fluent in both languages, who understands Chinese culture and Western culture is integral to producing good translations of Chinese, especially older works. So because maybe in modern Chinese, they might, you know, refrain from using some of these older traditions so much. But, uh, you know, the, the further you go back, the more that you need to really understand the culture in order to bring the meaning across. And it's often why translations of even simple things in Chinese vary so heavily. Right. Anyway, aside from that, the, the key point is that this book has really good translation. Right. So 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 that's good. Uh, that is a positive, you know, so and you often get these bits where he'll explain the translation in a square brackets. So and if he has taken liberty with the translation and he's sort of gone off piste a little bit, they put it in italics. Right. So all really good stuff for understanding it. So and then. So, yeah, the first part, as I said, is this translation of uh, this guy, Huang Bonians. Uh, who was an instructor at the Central Military Academy. So that is before it moved to Taiwan, right? So he was one of the guys that was in the, um, uh, you know, the uh, sort of Chinese Republican Army, um, you know, was helping train soldiers there uh, before they got involved with, uh, you know, so uh, fighting the communists, right? So, um, and so subsequently moved to Taiwan. So he was involved in real military training and the, that opening section reads like an actual military treatise. So it is short, it is direct, and it is to the point, right? But it contains a ton of really good information about Xingyi, right? And I, I very much recommend that you read it. Um, and it has very simple, like he's taken a lot of the Xingyi classics um, you know, like the eight word song and um, other sort of longer sections of, you know, Xingyi material, you know, the 12 key points, six harmonies, etc. Right. And he's just summed them up into a series of um, simple rules. So like rule one, rule two, rule three, rule four, rule five, you know, etc. Um, which is really good. Like and, you know, simple and direct. And I think that's, you know, it follows the Xingyi philosophy of it doesn't need to be elegant. It needs to be effective. And it follows that in the manner of writing, which I think is pretty cool. Um, 
So um, then you get onto the main section. So you, so you end up with, and that's, you know, that's actually, I think the best bit of the book is those first 18 pages, right? Where they do this, like I said, it's short and sweet, but it's good. Um, but then you get uh, Dennis going over all the sections, um, you know, and applications of each of the different elements, empty handed, um, and then with the saber uh, as well. Um, and then with bayonets replicating the spear techniques. So, and he does those each in turn, right? Uh, he, and he doesn't cover that, he only does the linking uh, spear form. So he doesn't do uh, the empty hand. So there's so a lot of material has been cut out, right? It's a very simplified cut down curriculum. It's not the whole thing. And I don't think he pretends that it is the whole thing, but it's a, you know, a simple introduction that was based off the stuff that was actually taught to the soldiers, because the key point is that the soldiers, you know, that he says, you know, they had about three hours a week of empty hand and, you know, close combat training amongst all the other stuff. Right. So by sort of full time martial arts standards, that's not a huge ton of stuff. Right. So they had to be selective. They didn't do the animal forms. Right. They didn't do, um, you know, Roshu pushing or pushing hands or soft hands type training. You know, they pretty much did the lines, um, the, you know, the, the five elements. Uh, some stuff with a sword, some stuff with the uh, with the rifle, and then they did some full contact, uh, you know, application training, um, and that was it, right? Which I think is a you know for a you know cut down syllabus where when you've got three hours a week to train, I think that's good. Like it's a, you know again, people more involved in this than me thought very carefully about it to design the the syllabus. So that's all the good stuff. Like it's uh, you know there's a lot of good stuff. Um, the no, let's come on to the negative points. So um, it's you know there are quite a lot of still photographs. Um, they're not done. They're done pretty well. So like quite often you get the the original lined up to somebody doing it in modern style, which I think is a nice feature. Um, but when you come to learning more complicated movement patterns, so like here for example, right where you're trying to learn the linking spear sequence with a, with a, 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 a uh, you know, a, a, a bayonet mounted rifle, it's, it's very, very hard, right? Because these, it, you can't even work out what the transition movements are. Again, it's not a fault of the book. It's just, this is not the right medium for learning this type of stuff, you know? So videos and per instruction, you know, personal instruction work a lot, lot better. Um, I'd also say that what the applications that he covers and the quality of movement that he displays in the book are of the basic form, right? Now, I don't know if that was a deliberate decision. Um, again, it doesn't matter if you're a beginner. So, you, you know, just learning that basic, like, okay, how do I use um, split, you know, the splitting fist of Xingyi? Well, I can chop down on someone's arm, you know? Um, okay, great. You know, that's good. That's one application, right? But of course, there's tons more. Um, and also it's, it's also just, it's always throughout that book. It's just the simplest version, right? It's the simplest, you know, thing. There's no hint of more. There's no talk about like the dragon body and more complex way of moving ways of issuing force. Um, you know, how to actually apply and use the difference between striking and china, like grabbing and seizing. None of this is covered, right? It's just like here, this technique, do this, try this, this one's this, this one's this, right? So I think, that is a weakness here is that it, it could be much more expansive um, in terms of, you know, what's going on, or at least say, you know, this is stage one and, you know, here's the other stuff that we want to look forward to and get to. Um, so that, that isn't really covered. So, so I'd say that that sort of, this is one of the slight negatives of this book. Um, so yeah, overall, definitely think good, well worth checking out. Um, really good on the history, really good on the translation of, uh, you know, an actual, uh, you know, real Chinese officers uh, training instructions to the troops. Um, not so good on the actual techniques that are there, but I think that's secondary to this, to this book. It's really, it's the quality of the content. There's also some really nice historical points about the use of the saber and how things changed over time. So overall, pretty good, right? So I definitely recommend this book if you're studying Xing Yi. Uh, it's not the best for learning the whole way of moving and what Xing Yi, um, you know, what the actual applications and movements are, but it is really good for giving you the essence of what the art is like. So I, I definitely recommend this book. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, let me know what other shingy books you want me to cover. I've got lots more planned. Uh, I don't know if Dennis has done any other books. I haven't really seen. So, but, um, you know, let me know if there's any of his other stuff that you want me to look at. Um, yeah, please like, share and subscribe. And best of luck with your practice, everyone. See you soon.